All right, so we are live. Welcome to Poetry Love Media. Uh, this is Sheldon speaking. And for today, uh, the theme is going to be on natural remedies and massage therapy. And today I have special guest, Mark Sims. Uh, you may want to introduce, and also Crystal Mayer Raymond, you want to introduce briefly about yourselves, please. Let our audience know what you guys do and where you're from, which province and so forth. All right, Crystal, you first. Me, oh, how lovely. Hi, my name is Crystal Mayer Raymond. I am a registered massage therapist here in Ontario. I live in Grand Valley, um, Ontario, and I do, I provide house calls, um, home visits, hospital visits, hospice visits to clients here in Peel region, mostly Peel region. I'm married, I have two kids. I've been practicing now for 15 years and I just began my studies as a midwife. So, my name is Mark Sims and I'm a certified holistic nutritional practitioner. I practice basically almost anywhere. And when I say almost, I mean, I go to the client's homes and I do the cons consultation with them there. I don't have an office as yet. Um, and what I focus on, I focus on lifestyle changes. So if there is a particular condition and I stress condition because disease is a condition and what happens, the body or the, the organ system, the organ system is under distress. So therefore, if you address what's causing the stress on those organs, then you can reverse it. And then the person will be in optimum health. So that's where I focus. I focus on educating in my clients on their conditions and also encouraging them to make certain lifestyle changes. I've been practicing. So I finished last, I finished my course last year in November. However, I've been doing this for approximately 20, maybe about 26 years just helping individuals along the way. Um, but officially, to get my certification, it's just been over a year. And it's been quite exciting. I have four children, three girls, one boy, ages my girl, Kezia, she is 20 years old. My son, Keenan, he is 17. My daughter is Shauna. She just turned 12 on the 14th. And Brianna is 13. To get my certification, it's just been over a year. I'm echoing, I hear my, my voice. All right, so that's about me. Okay, and you both are based in Ontario, correct? Correct. Awesome. Thanks for sharing uh, briefly about yourselves and allowing our viewers to know what you do and who you are. So now the question I have for you both is when did you become interested in natural remedies? Mm. All right, I'll go first. Because okay. yeah, this was the last time. So I became interested in natural remedies after I got married. So I got married in, in September 16th, 1989. And I became an Adventist Christian in November 1990. And so after becoming, after coming in contact with the Adventist faith, I found out that we ha actually have a health principle. And mm -hmm. my wife, she was never a meat eater. And I don't call it meat, I call it flesh. She was never a flesh eater. So I would buy it and it would stay in the fridge, in the freezer and, and become ice blocks. <laughs> and so after finding about the health message and finding out that our bodies were not designed to consume flesh foods, we immediately gave up all of that and became plant-based. So it's been quite some time. Okay, good. And what about you, Crystal? Um, I think I started in um, natural, uh, natural remedies. I would say more not necessarily the eating component, but definitely the exercise component when I was as young as 12. 
And I used to be this um, gym rat, as they call it. <laughs> um, and I was sitting in a sauna one day and I really, really like hydrotherapy, but I was sitting in a sauna one day. And I think now it was the Holy Spirit who told me that when I get older, I'm going to go into something that's health and fitness related. And so basically from the t- my all through my teenage years, I went to university. I graduated that. I was uh, into triathlons and um, Pilates and lots of running, marathon running, that kind of stuff, Ironman distance triathlons. And um, it wasn't until um, just before I got married in 2009 that my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, um, fell very ill and, um, and we were learning a lot about the Adventist message and, um, through his illness, we had some individuals coming from the Adventist church into our home, much like what Mark does now (laughs) and, um, teach, teach us, you know, how to eat so that his illness wouldn't be so critical. And so it's been a lifelong journey. I started off basically with exercise. And then when I was studying to be a massage therapist, then it became more hydrotherapy and massage related, and then now more um, nutrition based. So it's kind of like a lifelong journey. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Crystal and Mark. Now, my next question, were you always health conscious? This is for the both of you. Yes, I was. I, I was never the type to eat junk. I think my junk existed uh, with Snickers bar. I don't know if Snickers still exists. They do. Snickers. Yeah, they still do. <laughs> <laughs> that was way too quick of a response, Crystal. <laughs> I know. I know that. <laughs> so my junk food consisted of Snickers bar. And that was, if I ate a Snickers bar two weeks every two weeks that's a lot and I was I was very physically active so I, I was very much into sports and I enjoyed sports I enjoyed the amount of rigorous activities I got and it's quite exciting I loved it so yes I was always health conscious but I didn't know that I was actually it was a mind thing I didn't know it was a, it was actually a focus it just seemed like it was a natural thing for me. And then when I when I became more conscious of, of it, then I started doing even more things. So I got into, I love rock climbing. I'd actually like to join a rock climbing club. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, it's just my passion. I work out six days a week and mm-hmm. we're talking about some good intense workout. I love it. Oh, get my pumping, my blood pumping. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's good. What about you, Crystal? Um, I would have to say, aside from exercise, I have never been health conscious. Um, (laughs) And then the exercise, much like Mark, it was a seven days a week endeavor. And, you know, when I was doing my Ironman training, it would be not like this two, three hour type business. I would be training in the pool, out on the road, or anywhere between four and 10 hours a day. So the exercise was extreme and I would combat, not combat, I would unbalance that great extreme by eating garbage food. Um, (laughs) My body would want calories, of course, because I'm doing all this exercise. And I remember just, you know, buying um, Betty Crocker tubs of icing and going home and eating it with a tablespoon. Mark, don't laugh. And (laughs) so the, the exercise definitely was very extreme, but the nutrition was greatly lacking. Um, when I, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I would eat a Snickers bar every day. That's why I know that there's Snickers bars still exist. And I gained a lot of weight with my first pregnancy, but it wasn't until after like in between my first baby and my second baby that, um, I, I was introduced to something called the full plate diet by a, um, a fellow Adventist and, and colleague of mine. And, um, and I went through these, this full plate diet living thing and our seminar, and it was an eight week seminar. And um, I learned to eat a variety of foods that are colorful and more plant-based. 
and um, and not eat tubs of icing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. All right. Now, here's the question. What can one do for flu or COVID? And have you personally helped someone who contracted COVID? All right, that's me. So for flu or COVID, the biggest thing, and, and they, they tell you about the isolation part. So one thing that you need to understand is if you don't have a pre-existing condition, so a respiratory condition, then most likely you're, you're going to go through the same symptoms as you would for the flu, which would be, you could get a fever, you could get upset stomach, with nausea, maybe even some vomiting. I know of a particular individual who had it and all he got was a slight back pain and a mild headache. And it didn't last, I think it lasted for maybe, I think he said about 12 hours, but he didn't feel any, any ill effects. Now, the wonderful thing about that is your body builds antibodies. So should that virus attack that individual again, his body now recognizes that, hey, you've been here before and I know what to do. So it will actually attack that virus. So the, the symptoms either will be non-existent or it won't be as severe as the first time. Okay, for individuals who do have respiratory conditions or if you want to prevent as much as possible getting COVID, then you could do lemon juice in the morning. So freshly squeezed lemons, not reconstituted lemon juice. You can also take zinc lozenges or zinc tablets and you'll do one a day, the lemon juice, warm lemon water. And then you'd also increase your vitamin D. So your D3 for people who are plant-based, they'll be doing a D2 or you can actually get vegan D3 supplements now. So you'll be doing, so the daily recommendation for D, for vitamin D is 1000 IU, stands for international units. So you'd up that to about 3000. And the other thing that you would want to increase, you want to also increase your vitamin C, again, about another 3000. You would do that for about three days. And after that, your condition should have improved enough that you can reduce your levels. So you wouldn't need to do as much. And yes, I have. My sister actually, well, she, either she had or she thought she had, and I, I made the recommendations to her. And the other thing that I also added was uh, one tablet of that as well for three days, and then that was it. It is oregano, oil of oregano. That's what okay, it was. Okay, oregano oil, right. Yes. Okay. So you can get them in tablets as well. And the one I had was tablet. So I told her take a take one tablet three day, for three days. And after that, come off with the oil of, oil of oregano. Oil of oregano is really good, but you don't want to be doing it long term because it will actually destroy or kill your friendly bacteria. And you don't want that to happen. Okay, good to know. And so now what massage techniques for one who needs assistance in stress, tension, or anxiety? This is a great question. And I'm going to approach this um, under three sort of headlines. Um, for stress, all of us have stress. Whether you have good stress or bad stress, your body still recognizes it as stress. So let's just imagine that you mill, you, you win $10,000, your body is going to have the exact same amount of cortisol levels excreted as if, you know, your, your cat dies, you're still going to have cortisol in your body. So we uh, are trying to reduce the amount of cortisol in our, in our bodies when we're trying to reduce our stress and some quick things that we can do at home for ourselves to uh, reduce our stress. Number one is something called deep diaphragmatic breathing and basically sitting in a chair or lying on a bed. Um, I find that my patients um, prefer to lay down horizontal. They get a uh, better um, relaxation when they're doing that or a sympathetic response. So basically you're going to do belly breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth and try and get your belly to expand outwards, like towards the front of your body. And then 
your rib cage goes out to the side. And then finally you're going to breathe from your upper chest and then reversing it in that order. So your upper chest, then your rib cage comes in and then your belly falls down. And if you practice deep diaphragmatic breathing, that's one way to lower your sympathetic response and help to reduce your stress. Um, number, uh, number two is to increase your sleep. And there's a lot of things that, um, a lot of research talks about, um, removing, um, electronics from around your, from your bed space, um, and only keep your bedroom space, um, for sleeping and, um, marital extracurricular activities <laughs> and, um, keeping your bedroom cool and um, is also going to help promote sleep. But what sleep does is it helps to rebuild a lot of body uh, systems yeah. and it increases that parasympathetic response, which will also reduce your cortisol levels. Um, exercise is also number one or uh, number three in terms of reducing stress because it increases your endorphins. And um, I don't know if Mark is going to talk a little bit about that with different types of foods and things like that, but endorphins, uh, some daily, um, endorphin boosters. So walking is the best exercise out there. It's weight bearing. Yes. Um, but you do need a little bit of, um, weight bearing activity to promote good, um, bone density, um, as we age. And it also will boost up that endorphins, a nice deep breathing with that deep diaphragmatic breathing. Also to reduce stress, I find hydrotherapy to be really effective. And that's simply, um, you, you can do techniques simple as, you know, when you take your shower, um, you know, you have your, your, your hot water on there, you're soaping up, whatever. And then you're going to turn the cold, the water to as cold as you can manage it for about 10, 10 to 30 seconds. And then you're going to deep breathe there. And then you're going to turn the hot water back on and you're going to flip flop between that. But what that basically does is it increases the circulation and helps to flush out any metabolites, um, any dead cells in the lymphatic system, as well as excrete things through the circulatory system and through your yeah, urine and so forth. Um, moving on to tension relief. <clears throat> I'm here at my mother-in-law's house. So I found a, a little tennis ball here and a rolling pin. And these are great tools if you don't have a massage therapist on hand, um, like my husband does, but I don't really give him a massage, so I can't use that as an excuse. Um, <laughs> so what you're going to do with your tennis ball, this is particularly good for areas of the shoulder and the back, the upper shoulders and the back, because a lot of the times when we're on Zoom, we get a lot of neck and, and shoulder tension. So you're going to take your tennis ball there, you're going to put it on your back, and then you're going to lean against the wall. And you're going to kind of like squiggle back and forth, up and down on diagonals. And you're going to find kind of like a sweet spot that's sore, but feels good. And then you're just going to press back. We call that a compression. And you're just going to press back into that spot and wait about a minute or two. And it's important to use something like a tennis ball as opposed to a golf ball, because a tennis ball has more give and your body your, your body muscles are, have give as well. They're going to be hard at first, but when they get soft and supple, I'm going to make reference now to meat. Um, when they get soft and supple, like a boneless skinless chicken breast, that's thaw and raw. That's when you know that your muscle is in good health, good condition, and it's got good tone. If it's feeling like a frozen chicken breast, then you, you, you need to use this a lot more. Um, in areas that are difficult also on the buttocks, back of the legs, thighs, you could even use it for your arm. You're going to use your rolling pin and you're going to roll your body, right? And you can't get as much pressure doing it by yourself. Look, you can even do it on your neck. Check it out. Instead of my rotis, I'm going to roll my neck, right? And, <laughs> and what's important to help to reduce the tension and also leading into anxiety is that when we're applying these methods that we do them really slow or rhythmical. Okay. So the slow or more rhythmical that we provide these modalities to our body, the more relaxation we're going to have, the less anxiety and the more tension relief. If we're going to like really jam and go really, really hard, then we're telling our body to wake up and to let's go fight a bear or catch the bus or study for an exam or go run a 100 meter sprint. So we want our modalities to be done slow, rhythmically and controlled.
And then now our third topic is the anxiety. And to reduce anxiety, this can be a number of different things, but not necessarily massage techniques. But number one, research is talking about um, increased meditation. And I know for our Christian community, meditating on the word of God, we can be grateful. I know there's a big gratitude thing out there. So giving testimonies, God has done X, Y, Z for me. And then when you talk it out loud, that's also going to help to reduce my anxiety and, and praise God simultaneously. Um, another thing, another method is to do something called grounding. So walking outside on the grass, bare feet. And I know a lot of our Caribbean peoples, our African peoples, they tend not to like to do this. But um, here and in North America, it's not a very um, prominent activity to do. But if you can get outside with your feet in the dirt, in the grass, it's really, really helped to ground you and to reduce your anxiety. Um, getting some fresh air and doing that deep diaphragmatic breathing again is also very helpful. Doing some stretching like neck stretching, if we're all going to do this right now to reduce some neck tension and neck um, because our neck tension is associated with anxiety as well, because we breathe from our upper necks or our, our neck muscles, which are in our upper chest. And so to stretch those muscles, we're just going to bring our ear to our shoulder and then hold it for either three deep breaths in and out. You could do that and then switch sides, three deep breaths in and out, making sure that your ears to your shoulder and not rotating just yet because those will stretch different muscles. So the big muscle, the trapezius is great to stretch this way. Again, three deep breaths in and out. And if you have somebody that's worried about you with anxiety, or if somebody that you know and love is anxious, you can do techniques called rocking, stroking, or static contact. And rocking basically is like, you know, when you rock a baby and you kind of like bounce them around like this. If you do any one of these techniques for longer than two minutes, then it's going to create a, a mechanical effect, something using the gate theory. And that's going to help to soothe the nerves and to bring down that sympathetic, par uh, sympathetic nervous system firing and help to reduce that cortisol level as well. You can also do stroking. So that would be just be like, I'm just going to demonstrate on my hand on my forehead here. So just, just length light uh, stroking across any part of the body. If you do it across the spine, just let gentle stroking across the spine, that's also very effective in soothing the nerves and reducing anxiety or simply static contact, which is basically just placing your hand on somebody and holding it there for longer than two minutes. Obviously, if it's a stranger, you have to have permission, but if it's your, your loved one, your friend or a hug, Again, that static contact, if you hold that longer than two minutes, then you're going to increase that parasympathetic nervous system firing and decrease that cortisol level. So those are some different modalities. I know I talked a lot about that, but I, I think those are all really important. No, I'm glad you touched on that because Jesus, he was in touch with the people, right? His hand. He was. There's a powerful ministry of touch yes. that we often take for granted. So that's important. Thank you for sharing that, Crystal. You want to add something? I, I think I don't want to cut you. No. Okay. Um, any protocols for inflammation? Yes. Mark, do you want to go first? Yeah, both of you. Questions for both of you. <laughs> so for inflammation. So inflammation is one of those things that people tend to get really excited about. And when I say excited, I mean they really start getting freaked out about it. Whereas inflammation is, it's, it's very easy to control, very easy to manage, very easy to actually get rid of. So things like ginger, ginger is in your house. I have a, just a quick story with you. There was a lady, I work in a school and this lady, I saw her walking, she was limping. And I said, what's going on? And she said, my knee, my knee, I have arthritis in my knee and it hurts. And I said to her, okay, here's what you'll do. Take ginger. You have ginger because I know she has ginger. She's, she's from uh, Pakistan, I believe, and ginger is their staple. So take some ginger, grater it on a cheesecloth. So what, what she was basically doing was making a poultice. So grater it, and I told her, apply it to the, the area that's infected, so the area that hurts. 
then you're gonna take saran wrap and wrap that around it, then put a cloth over that and then put a heating pad over that, go to bed. The next day she comes, uh, she comes out of the building and she's walking and she's, Mr. Sims, look, Mr. Sims. And she's walking and she's, she's shaking her leg around. And I, it didn't hit me until she said, no pain. I go, look at that. Hey, Amen. No, look at that. Amen. So Amen. simple thing like ginger, garlic. Now, you have to be careful with garlic because garlic is, is uh, a blood thinner, but it's a, it's a mild blood thinner. So you don't want to be using too much. Onions also help with that. You can also make for a bit more. So if you have things like activated charcoal, that would help with inflammation as well. You can also use clay will also help with that. If you have, um, so the foods that you would want to eat. So plant-based diet is very effective for inflammation because it's alkalizing. So if your body is slightly more acidic than alkaline, that creates an environment for disease and also imbalance. So you want to have more plant-based foods. So you want to decrease and you also want to make sure how you're eating. Eating is very important. So if you're consuming, let's say, for example, fruits and vegetables because of their different digestion times, it help, that helps to pollute the blood. So you don't want to com combine the two. You'll have, let's say, if you're having your vegetables, then you'll have that an hour before you have your fruits. If, and again, if you're having fruits, you don't want to com combine certain fruits together either. For example, you don't want to combine your melons with your apples because the water content is higher in the lemon, sorry, in the watermelon. So you'll have the melons by themselves and you'll have the other fruits by themselves. I love saying this part, the brassicas. So your brassica vegetables, such as your broccoli, your kale, cauliflower, those are fantastic for inflammation because of how they, they get used in the system. They actually help to clear out the colon, but they also help to balance blood sugar. So a lot of glucose is not entering into your bloodstream quickly. So the other big thing is water, water, water. If you're getting enough hydration, then that also helps to combat inflammation. So inflammation, too much inflammation could also lead to different diseases. And they've also found that inflammation leads to cancer. So if you're able to get that inflammation down, get it managed. Another thing too is essential fatty acids. So because I'm plant-based, my essential fatty acid comes from um, omega-3. So you're looking at olives. Uh, there's also a seaweed that gives you omega-3. So there are different ways you can get that. But for people who aren't, the fish oils are what they would consume. So that's great for inflammation. It also does a whole bunch of other things that, you know, if I had time, I'd get into it. But essential fatty acids is one and also B-complex. So your B-complex vitamins, fantastic. And B-complex, so your B vitamins are water soluble. So when you take your Bs, if your urine comes out fluorescent orange or fluorescent yellow, it's because your body uses it and then it flushes out the rest. And those are just a few things that you can do for information. But the main one is the water and the plant-based diet. So you want to have more of an alkalized diet than an acidic diet. So if your foods are alive, then you're getting more alkaline. If they are dead, then you're getting more acidic. Okay. Very good. What about you, Crystal? So um, I love talking about inflammation. <laughs> Um, like Mark, I could say a lot about the cellular process of inflammation. Oh, we have some visitors here. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> That's the video of live. <laughs> it's raw. <laughs> so Mark, just to, while, while we wait for Crystal, um, yes. you mentioned a very important point because many often, even as a dentist, we ask, oh, why can we can't miss our fruits and vegetables? Or why can't we have to eat our melons by itself? I like how you break it down in terms of the water content. Mm -hmm. So it's important you were actually to break down as to why, because we're often told, told, don't do this, don't do that. But we are often not told why. So that's important. Okay. 
<laughs> so think of a bowl. Think of a bowl. You have a bowl and then fill that bowl with water. Okay. And then let's say you're going to eat bread. You're going to eat some pasta. You're going to eat rice. Uh, you're going to have some fruits in there as well. So apples, pears, bananas. Then you're going to, for people who consume flesh foods, you're going to put some flesh food in there. What ends up happening, so your stomach, fantastic piece of machinery. I love our organs. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. What ends up happening, all that food that's sitting in that water, it will sit there. And the body, your stomach doesn't produce the hydrochloric acid that it needs to break all that food down because of all that water. Or if you started eating and you're drinking, it dilutes the hydrochloric acid so it doesn't get to do its work. First, the stomach has to absorb. So think of a sponge absorbing water. That's how your stomach works. It absorbs the liquid first. That takes time. As it's absorbing the liquid, the food that's sitting in the stomach, it starts to ferment. So you end up getting gas from both ends, from out the mouth and the anus. Not a good sign because the longer it takes for that food to actually break down, the longer it takes for it to transit from mouth to out. The other thing that you're, you're looking at is because you're now, you've digested, you've diluted that, that hydrochloric acid, all those enzymes that would go to help break that food down they now are also being moved all over the place. So it doesn't get to work as it should. So in a nutshell, combining liquids with your food or eating melons with a melon's high water content with other foods that are not, you're just combining liquids. The digestion time gets longer. And depending on also what you're eating, it also doesn't go well with our blood. It actually helps put, it goes to poison the blood. So that's why. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mark. We'll save it questions for the end because I see somebody wrote in the YouTube chat a question in terms of raw acidity. Um, are raw plant based diets more alkaline than cooked? From when the subscribers actually, do you want to ask that quickly or we, we wait? Are raw, raw vegetable diets more alkalizing than cooked? Yes, they are. Uh, that's a simple answer. Yes, they are. The raw food, and I would love to go raw food, but I think um, for me, I would do 70% raw, 30% cooked. And the reason why is because some, some foods are better absorbed cooked as to raw. And the question will come up like what? For example, tomatoes, they are better absorbed cooked. Um, and the other thing too is, the cherry tomatoes are actually better than the beef steak because they're higher on lycop lycopene. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, okay, Crystal, for the inflammation, can you answer that question for us? Thank you, Mark. Yes, thanks, Mark. Um, so um, in terms of hydrotherapy and inflammation, when somebody, let's just imagine you fall down the stairs and you have a really big bruise on your body. It could be a cut, it could be a bruise, it could be um, any kind of injury. The first 48 hours, your body is on cleanup crew duty. And so, and so to assist with this cleanup crew, um, you're going to apply a cold pack or ice pack, something cold to the area that has been injured. I know that there's research currently suggesting that instead of putting cold, that you put heat. And um, from my experience, I think that the heat can actually create more inflammation because inflammation, it doesn't know when to stop. It's, <laughs> it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if, if we add heat to it, then it's just going to get bigger. So we're drawing more circulation to the area that's been injured. So that's why I prefer to add something cold. Now, I know a lot of my patients are not a fan of cold things. And I understand that, um, that it's uncomfortable, but your body's going to go through a, a, a few phases that we call C-BAN. C-B-A-N. C stands for cold. It's going to feel cold when you put an ice pack on your body. Um, and it's meant to do that. 
um, then then your body after it's feeling cold for you know a minute or so then it's going to start to feel like a burning sensation and most people if they haven't properly wrapped their ice pack or their ice ice cube or whatever cold device that they're using if they haven't wrapped it properly and protected the skin then the burning is going to become so intense that you're actually going to get frostbite so we need to make sure that when we're applying our colds to our bodies, to our injured areas, that we have it wrapped in a paper towel, a dishcloth, a thin towel, a piece of clothing, anything like that. Or if you don't have cloth, then if you put a thin layer of lotion on your skin, will also help to protect the moisture barrier in your skin so that you can apply that cold directly to the area. So after cold, then it's going to feel like a burning sensation. Most people take it off at that point in time, but you want to keep it on after that burning sensation. That takes about two to three minutes for that burning sensation to go away. Um, then it's going to have like an A effect or like an analgesic effect. Um, so the reduction in pain is going to take place during that A analgesic effect um, time period. And that maybe is around another minute or so, two minutes after that burning sensation. And then finally, the N stands for numb. So after the analgesic effect, the reduction in pain, the area is going to start to feel numb and it's not going to feel cold anymore. It's when you get to this end stage that you have really cooled the area enough that you can actually take off the ice from, from that injured area. And it's kind of allowed more quarantining of that injured area by those white blood cells. So the cold is very important in the first 48 hours of that injury response. Between 48 hours and seven days, that's what we call the early subacute stage. And you're going to try something called contrast hydrotherapy. And so to do this, you're going to be, uh, need to be close to your kitchen or your bathroom or somewhere where you have a hot and cold device um, to heat up your, your water or your, or your cooling devices. So um, if I was going to use a heating pad, I'm going to plug it in and then maybe, you know, an ice pack that I have in my freezer. And you want to make sure that your heating pad is going to stay at a consistent temperature and that my ice pack is going to stay at a consistent temperature as best as you possibly can. And I'm going to put cold on that injured area for three minutes. And then I'm going to remove that. Then I'm going to put the heat on for one minute and I'm going to repeat that process. Three minutes cold, one minute heat, three minutes cold, one minute heat. Very important in the early subacute stage, we finish with cold for three minutes. And that's to continue to reduce the inflammation from that injured area. After the seven day period between seven days and 21 days, we call that the late subacute stage. And we're going to take that contrast hydrotherapy. And now we're going to flip it instead of doing three minutes cold, one minute heat, like we did in the early subacute stage, we're now going to do in the late subacute stage, three minutes of heat, one minute of cold, finishing with heat at the very end to promote good circulation. At this point in time, our body is really consolidating a lot of healing in the tissue that's been damaged. And the, the heat at the very end is going to promote good blood flow. We know that life is in the blood and we're going to bring lots of good nutrients into the tissue that's been damaged with the blood and with the heat. And then finally, after 21 days of an injury, you can just use heat. I usually recommend for about 20 minutes on the injured area to help promote good circulation through the injured tissue. And, um, and it should hopefully be healed by that point in time, 21 days. If you have things like a fracture, then obviously it's going to take a lot longer. You're looking at three months as opposed to three plus weeks. Um, so it also depends on the um, extent of the damage that's been done. But if you're ever unsure of what to use first, I know a lot of clients, they're like, oh, my shoulders are sore. I'm just going to slap a pack of uh, heat on there or a hot water bottle. I say that can do damage too sometimes if you're having a spasm. Spasms, when you lose range of motion, 
completely or oh, very close to completely. And in that case, the best scenario, the best thing to do is to go for cold. Always go for cold. When you're in doubt, go for the cold and keep it on for that C-band around 10 minutes. Very good. Um, actually, you said something that was very interesting. Uh, do you also perform ice massages to your patients? Yes. And this is good for inflammation as well or other uh, ailments? Infl um, the ice is, uh, remember we talked about that C-band, that analgesic effect? Yeah. So the ice massage is predominantly used for people who have a trigger point, which means a knot and a knot specifically with a referral pattern. So I've had a client where they've had a knot in their neck, but they feel pain down their hand and arm. So with the ice massage, I'm actually going to massage their body down the hand and arm with that ice to promote that analgesic effect in their referred pattern that they have the pain, even though the problem's up here on their neck. And then I'm going to do some massage up here. I'm going to do, I'm going to use my, my rolling pin, my compressions to try and release that trigger point there in the neck while addressing also their pain that they're having in their arm. Very good. Okay. So any testimonials we do share extra from your, from your clients that you have worked with, any testimonials we've helped people with different ailments? I'll start with Mark and then Crystal, you'll go. Well, I have a friend and she had called my wife and, and she was telling my wife about her condition and she was crying on the phone and my wife says, you should call Mark. And she just kept on telling my wife what's going on with her. And my wife says, you should call Mark. Well, their conversation ended and she didn't call me. I think she called me maybe two, three weeks afterward. And she was crying on the phone and she was telling me all that was happening with her. And she has Crohn's disease. And when she told me this, I was, I was in the middle of, basically I was on the end of my studies where I had to focus on writing assignments and preparing for final exams. And I said to her, I, I don't have the time to do a proper assessment on you, but based on what you're telling me, this is what I recommend. So what had happened was because we're Crohn's, uh, the doctor had, they had, she had, um, hemorrhoids, internal and external hemorrhoids. They had removed the external hemorrhoids. She was having difficulty going to the bathroom. So her bowel movements were, were not, almost non-existent. And so I recommended first that put her on some juices and she had lost a lot of weight. And normally what I would do, I would do a, a detox, but I wasn't able to do that with her because of the weight loss. So I put her on some juices. So juices specific to her Crohn's. And I also took her off of all dairy, um, flesh foods. I took her off of um, gluten as well because gluten irritates that particular condition. So I also encouraged her to walk. So she wasn't exercising, I encouraged her to walk. And about, about a week afterwards, she was having regular bowel movements. And in about, about maybe Three weeks after that, when I called to check on her, she said, Mark, because normally what she would do, because she was in the bathroom for so long, she'd be in there for maybe about nine, from 9 a.m. to about 1, 2 in the afternoon. And she says, Mark, I hardly get enough time to, to open an app now. And she just goes in and she's done. She's out. And her experience is, has been fantastic. She now, she's living a regular life. She was concerned that she wouldn't be able to have children. They wanted to put her on a colostomy bag. And all of that was avoided because she changed her lifestyle. And her doctor couldn't believe that just by changing her diet, exercising, and adding a few little things, like I said, that omega-3 and some probiotics, fantastic. So that changed her entire life. And she is living her best life right now. Amen. Thanks for sharing. What about you, Crystal? And Crystal, um, before you share, there's a uh, there's someone on YouTube that asks you a question for you directly. Um, they are asking, asking who? On YouTube, Crystal. Asking Crystal actually. Oh. <laughs> I just missed the question. The person's asking: Are moist heating pads better than dry 
heat heating pad. And then after that, you can share your testimonial on your. Yes. Yes. Moist heating pads are better than dry heating pads. Um, because the moist heating pads will penetrate muscular layers deeper and quicker because we're made of water. So like attracts like, and it will just penetrate the, um, the tissue better and quicker. If you don't have a moist heating pad um, or like a clay pack, um, then you can use your electric heating pad. Take a, um, a large towel, like a larger than a hand towel, probably what one of those body towels or medium sized towels, um, wring it out in some hot water and then wrap that hot water towel around your electric heating pad, not around the wire, just the pad. <laughs> and then you can place it directly on your body and that will that will do the trick as well very good and do you have a testimonial of i do i'm gonna jump on uh with mark's um constipation thing i've had many 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 clients that have had a lot of um, pain relief over the last 15 years and i can think of some really really dramatic ones um people who've come back from car accidents uh, scoliosis where they're wheelchair bound and now they're walking um, but, um, one that stands out to me right now, just talking about the constipation is, um, when I first came into practice, um, I had a colleague of mine, I was working at the YMCA at the time and she was a personal trainer. She was really, really fit. And she came to me, she knew I was in massage college. I was actually still in school. And mm -hmm. she told me that she was constipated. She hadn't had a bowel movement. And I think it was five days which is a long time for somebody who is very physically active and drinks lots of water. And she was basically compacted at that point in time. So I performed a constipation massage on her and she, and I told her to go home, drink water, do some deep breathing, um, do some Kegel exercises, some sit-ups that always helps uh, with peristaltic movements. And she did all that. And she called me back half an hour later and she had already had a movement. So it's a simple massage that we can perform.